Tim Hill, who is the Conservation Manager for Hertfordshire and Middlesex Wildlife Trust. Thank you. Thank you, Mel, and uh, thank you very much for inviting us along to speak this evening. Can everybody hear me okay at the back? Is that picking up her work? Okay, great. Okay, we'll make a start. So this is a nightingale. This is an adder, the only venomous snake in Britain. This is a white clawed crayfish. This is our own only native species of crayfish. So those three species are all extinct in Hertfordshire and they've all gone extinct in the last 50 years in Hertfordshire. You've probably heard in the news that internationally a, a million species are currently threatened with extinction. It's happening here, right in, in, in our own area um, as we speak. So the report you can see on the screen now is the Hertfordshire State of Nature report. And this was produced by Hertfordshire Middlesex Wildlife Trust in 2020. It was launched literally as the pandemic started here. And it was a result of about a year's work and a result of people recording, going out, collecting information hundreds of years before that. We're very fortunate in Hertfordshire that we have a very, very strong conservation community of people going out recording their local wildlife and it was a result of that information that had been collected for those years this document produced and this document was essentially a comparison of the state of nature in Hertfordshire in 2020 compared to 1970 so it was comparing 50 years and what had happened uh, during that time and in that 50 years 76 species had gone extinct and there are now 1446 species in Hertfordshire at threat of extinction. That's a huge number. I just asked Mel and here there are about 80 seats. So this is almost how many species have gone extinct in the last 50 years. Different species every one of these seats in this room. That brings it home to you. And it will continue unless we do something uh, dramatically and if we, unless we do something quickly. So we do have a nature crisis. Everybody talks about climate crisis at the moment, but equally we have a nature crisis happening every day at the moment. So it's happening alongside the, the climate crisis. So uh, in Hertfordshire, uh, we have a, a declared climate crisis, which is happening at the moment. That was declared by Hertfordshire County Council. That was followed up by here in decorum. Um, Mel spoke earlier about uh, the declaration of the, the climate and ecology crisis here. And um, from our perspective, from a wildlife trust perspective, um, it's important that we do recognise both of them and we take action to try and address both of them as we go forward. So I want to break down the state of nature report uh, initially down into our main habitats that are found in Hertfordshire. The grasslands to start with. Uh, so of that 76 species which I mentioned to you, uh, 34 grassland species have gone extinct in the last 50 years, which is about 14% species that were um, looked at by this report. In terms of woodlands, um, 26, 26 species went extinct. And this is, this is even more surprising because over that 50 years, woodlands have actually increased in Hertfordshire. Uh, we've got more woodlands uh, now than we had in 1970. But what's happened is our older woodlands, the ancient semi-natural woodlands, um, they've had a lack of habitat, a lack of intervention, which has meant that we've lost the structure which supports greater biodiversity. They've all become rather homogenous, um, very closed canopy. We've lost that, um, that ground flora, we've lost that shrub layer, which a lot of these species depend upon. So most of those species, those 26 species that have gone, are invertebrate species, which depend on that complexity of the ecosystem. In terms of wetlands, we've lost about 12 um, species uh, in that 50 years. Wetlands have been another big loser um, in the 50 years or so. Um, many of these species rich grasslands, maximum biodiversity, um, they've been lost 
um, as a result of loss of grazing primarily. Uh, there is not much grazing now goes on in Hertfordshire. So some of those older species, which for us has depended on the grazing action of cattle or sheep, maintain that diversity. And, and so those grasslands have reverted to a much, much less diverse sward. And accordingly, um, the, the diversity of sports for those vertebrates is well. So 12 different species um, ha have been lost uh, along the way. This is a map of Hertfordshire which shows um, species rich grasslands of county importance. Each one of those red blobs on the map there uh, is a local wildlife site. So these are our grasslands of, of county importance. And you can see uh, what, what's striking is that none of them are very big. Um, and what's more striking is that they're so disparate, really. Uh, they're all uh, not connected. And uh, that means that species trying to move through those grasslands are going to be having a very difficult time. Unless they can fly uh, between each one of those, it's going to be very, very difficult. And as you know, Hertfordshire, lots of very busy roads, lots of development all going on uh, uh, in between those places. So it means it's incredibly difficult for, for species to move through. And if I showed you similar maps for our, our diverse woodlands or our wetlands, it would be a similar picture, really. It, it's that lack of connectivity com <coughs> combined with uh, the lack of diversity or reduced diversity, which is causing uh, the ecology crisis. So we do indeed need a joined up solution to a joined up problem. Uh, and this is a quotation. Uh, so science is now clear that biodiversity loss and climate change are inextricably linked and to tackle one, we need to tackle the other. So there's one message I would urge you to take home this evening is to try to do something about the climate crisis and the ecology crisis because they are completely joined up. We need to do as much as we can. So starting to talk about um, carbon capture, um, carbon capture and storage is the only hope for mankind. This is a quotation from Sir David King, who was the um, chief uh, advisor to David Cameron's government, to other successive governments. So an absolute expert in his own field. And uh, the trouble is with the um, greenhouse gases, the carbon dioxide and methane, they just don't go anywhere. So once they've been emitted into the atmosphere, they, they hang around for a long, long time. So Clearly, we need to reduce emissions, stop that getting any worse. But what we also need to do is capture as much of that carbon and seal it up so that it is uh, out of the atmosphere and reduce cooling as well. And we clearly want to talk about trees as, as important um, carbon capturers. Uh, but actually, it's, it's soil uh, is one of the most important things. Um, Carbon is, is captured in the soil. So next to the oceans, a bigger, bigger store uh, of carbon. And better, the more diverse the soil, the more carbon it will hold. So we need to think about working from the ground up and making our soils rewild, rewilded again, uh, because that, that will hold much more carbon. So how can we do that? Well, we do that by rewilding our soils and thereby capturing carbon possibly can. So this is this is a wonderful little illustration showing some of our, our native uh, wildflowers um, and what they can do for the soil. So hopefully you can see that easily. So the one that I think is absolutely amazing is this one here going up. So um, the fifth in from the right hand side there is the bird's foot trefoil. So this is, uh, this is a plant that you'll see in, in most species diverse grasslands. And you can see there, its roots are going down a metre and a half into the soil. And so by do, so doing, um, it's taking all that carbon down into the soil. And as those roots break down over time, that becomes the humus in the soil. And so it's a fantastic plant for just wilding those soils. And you can see other examples all the way along there. So that's why we, 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 we great campaigns for species-rich grasslands, such an important component um, of, our, of our rewilding, of capturing carbon uh, for the We need more species grasslands as well as those woodlands. Well. 
a holistic approach. So what, what do we need to do um, to um, try and redress this nature crisis that we're facing at the moment? Well, the rallying call nationally is that we need more wildlife places, we need bigger wildlife places, we need better managed wildlife places, and we need them all connected up to allow those animals to move through our landscape, to move through our environment. Based on the information that was gathered for the State of Nature report, um, the conclusion was that we need to have about 30% of all the land in Hertfordshire um, set aside for nature by 2030. So 30 by 30 is our rallying call, and that's based on good science, that's based on the information that was gathered for this document. And in Hertfordshire, that means an extra 20,000 hectares of land for nature. So um, I'm not particularly good on areas, but a hectare is about the same, just less than, or just, just more than uh, a football pitch or rugby pitch. So an extra 20,000 football pitches for nature um, by 2050 is what we're looking at. So what have we been doing? So I just want to give you some examples of what our community wildlife trust have been doing over the last 10 or 15 years to try to um, mitigate for, uh, for the losses that we're facing. So going back about 10 years, we had a project called Wild Stevenage. And this started with us being commissioned by a student borough council to write a biodiversity action plan for the whole of, whole of Stevenage. And you can see the plan there on the right hand side. And out of that, we identified a number of projects, wilding projects, and through funding from the lottery, and Stevens Borough Council themselves enabled us to employ a, a project officer. And she worked with the council and with lots of fantastic volunteers over a few years. And this is just one of the projects there. It's one of the verges in Stevenage that we changed the mowing regime on. So rather than it being gang mown to two inches long every month, it was allowed to grow long and then cut once a year uh, to encourage the wildflowers. And uh, one of the areas that was managed like that eventually became a local wildlife site. So it actually transformed uh, through, through that process and it's now a species of meadow. Volunteers monitored the butterflies um, on, that, on that meadow and they increased as you would expect as well. More recently in St Albans, uh, Emma mentioned it in her talk a little bit earlier, we have a, a project called Wild St Albans uh, which is taking place and um, this is a new project working, working with St Albans District Council and this came out of consultation forums like this, where it became clear that people, individuals like every one of us, are wanting to do as much as possible for the biodiversity crisis, but didn't know what to do, where to do it, or how to do it. So we put a proposal to St. Albans Council, and uh, delighted that they uh, accepted that proposal, and that they have now funded a project officer, Heidi Carruthers, for two years, to work with people in St. Albans to help them make a difference for wildlife. It started in April and uh, it's been even more popular and successful than we could possibly hope to start with. And we're being inundated now with requests for help with biodiversity, but that's what it's all about. And just wanted to highlight one of the, um, the community projects that's part of that, which is called Wilderhood Watch. Uh, this is from their website here. And that, that is a, it was a community driven initiative um, by a lady called Nat Nadia Bashara who's a resident of St. Albans, and she is just bringing neighbours together to, to make a difference, to do that joined up approach to, to nature conservation. So, fabulous initiative. Um, if you just Google Wilderhood Watch, uh, you'll find that, and you can do that because it's something that could easily be uh, copied and, and rolled out elsewhere. Just wanted to um, give you a, a few examples of uh, how we need to actually start putting nature back as well. So in some places, literally nature has gone and it's really nice. So as part of Wild St. Albans, uh, this is a project which we completed in August of this year, and we reintroduced water voles back to the River Ver, uh, just outside St. Albans. They've gone extinct there in 1987, and the nearest population to them now is way down at Rickmansworth, so we'd have to wait decades probably for them to come back. So we decided to um, Put them back ourselves. So we brought 150 voles um, and put them onto the ver. They're doing very, very well at the moment, and we really hope that they've all joined forces and mated, and we should have perhaps 200 young voles now on the river as well. 
So that's really important because it is within our gift we can uh, make a difference by doing that. Sort of thing. Where the science is right and where we know that animals will thrive where they, they've been lost from previously, put them back. Another example of this is the Trust has over 40 nature reserves um, uh, in, in, in and across Oxford and Middlesex. And uh, this is an example, again, of by managing nature reserves in the right way, we can bring nature back as well. So this is, this is a Hillfield Park Reservoir, and this is um, uh, a nature reserve that we manage for uh, Affinity Water. Uh, they own the reservoir. And over the last few years, as a result of a new management plan, we've been uh, manipulating the edges of the reservoir to create lots of new shallows, um, varying the profile of these areas. And as a result of that, uh, we have now got thousands upon thousands of, of fish breeding and doing much, much better out there than they did previously. And of course, fish are a very important part of the food chain, where there are fish of those sorts, everything from great crested uh, greaves, kingfishers, black neck greaves, all of these birds that feed on fish um, will do very, very well. So it's starting at the bottom, you're having that ecosystem approach to make a difference. Coming right back now to, to decorum itself, um, we've been working with Decorum Borough Council now for a, for a couple of years. And this is taking action for swifts. Swifts are one of our summer migrants arriving here from Africa in May, and they depart in about August, so they're not with us for very long, so they travel a long way. And uh, they, they breed mostly now in, in our houses, um, particularly in older houses where there's holes in uh, barge boards, soffits uh, just underneath the roof line. But with all the changes that are going on with UBPC becoming the norm for, for replacing those, Swifts are being locked out of homes. So based on work that we did um, in Stevenage, We've now um, taken to working with other local authorities, and this is particularly with part of Decorum Council uh, that work with social housing. And uh, we have uh, we have a technique now of attaching uh, swift nesting boxes uh, when the roofs are being replaced or when repairs are taking place to allow swifts in and provide them with the nesting space that they've gone. And a uh, photograph there is at uh, St Albans Hill in, in Hemel Hempstead, and uh, 20 boxes were put there in 2020 and swift 50 first swift back in may immediately occupied one of the nesting boxes and, and bred successfully again so there's a lot we can do just by being a little bit creative so we do need to continue doing action it's all about action we, we need to do that so three iconic species there you've got dormice waterfowl and marsh tit um, three species which are still birds of teetering on the brink of extinction in Hertfordshire, so what can we do? Well, we all have it within our gift to do something to help the nature crisis. And uh, we have five things here that um, I would like you to consider, your gardens or anywhere that you have control over. Plant a tree, create a pond, make room for dead wood, make a home for bees, grow flowers all year long, Oh, and there's a sixth one there, which has become a member of your local wildlife trust. But I would say that, wouldn't I? And uh, because every little does help, um, every bigger is every bigger project is even better. So very quickly, I know I'm just running out of time here. Plant a tree. We can all fit a tree into our garden if you pick the right tree in the right place. This is a rowan. Rowan, fantastic trees because they don't take up much space. Uh, the flowers are fantastic for insects uh, in the spring and then the berries during the winter time provide food for things like blackbirds. Create a pond, make a frog happy. This is, this is one of the best things we can all do. Every pond's a winner, literally. Uh, you can't go wrong. Make frogs happy, make dragonflies happy, everything else. Dead wood, an underrated habitat, but uh, beetles particularly rely on these. So if you want to bring bats and bald bats, you've got to have dead wood. So many species of beetles spend most of their lives munching through the dead wood as, as the larvae, things like stag beetles, you know, our largest beetle. We can do things like make home for bees. So really a straightforward process. This is just a lump of wood, which I got from eight millimeter drills, there are lots of holes in it. And things like these red mason bees almost immediately will take up home. Make 
hole, hole in the board. And the ground flowers all, all along. This is my back garden. Um, I, I call it a lawn. It's not really a lawn. It's, it's a lovely flowery meadow. But lots of that bird's hoof trefoil, which I told you about. Lots of self heel, lots of white clover, and absolutely buzzing um, in the summertime. And you can add to your lawn if you've got a grassy lawn at the moment. Get some seed, uh, overseed it, do that. And lastly, if you do any of these things, uh, please would you watch what comes and uses your or lawns, gardens, and record it and then submit it to the Hertfordshire Natural History Society or the Hearts Environmental Record Centre because we need to know it's using these spaces because what we have to think about is when we write the next one of these in 50 years' time, how are we going to know whether we're getting better, worse, or going sideways unless we've got more information? So please do record um, what you see and do that. The last thing I just wanted to say is um, three little ones there enjoying watching some birds at a local nature reserve. These are the people that we need to turn into the future naturalists. These are the, the people we need to go out and record the bees, the water bowls, the birds, and everything else. Because I'm a, I'm a trustee of the Hartford Natural History Society in a voluntary capacity, and unfortunately, the age range of recording. Recording naturalists now is going up and up and up. Desperately need more youngsters getting involved in nature conservation, getting the skills to be able to identify the things so that we know what's going on in the future. So I'll end it there. So thank you very much for listening. We may have questions later. Yeah? Okay. I'm gonna hand I'm gonna hand over to Joe Sutherwood now from the Eastern New England. Good evening, everyone. Really nice to see so many of you here this evening and nice to be here in person as well. Uh, so my name is Jo Southernwood and I'm here from the Eastern New Energy Project today. Um, so Eastern New Energy, it's a, a funded project that's offering a wide range of support to businesses, organisations, community groups, charities to help them to rapidly decarbonise their operations. So the project is all about decarbonisation and helping them to reach their net zero carbon targets. And I think that um, businesses in particular have had a really difficult time over the last couple of years. You've had uh, Brexit to deal with, you've had a global pandemic to deal with. Now you're also being asked to um, meet, help to meet the government's net zero carbon targets. And we're all hearing things coming out of COP26 happening in Glasgow right now. I'm quite sure that off the back of COP26, there will be even more requirements on businesses, on communities, on us all as individuals to make changes in our, our lives, our homes, our businesses. So I think we're only going to see more stringent targets and we're only going to see businesses um, being asked to do more. Now, I spend a lot of time talking to businesses, particularly at the smaller end, so the small and medium sized enterprises, the SMEs. And often what I hear from them is this, I want to do something, I want to minimise my impact, I really want to do my part, but I don't know where to start. I don't have the time, I'm busy running a business, I don't have the resource, I don't have the background knowledge, and because I don't have the time, I'm not sure what to do because I'm being given lots of different messages from lots of different people. So I see a few nods around the room. If that's you, in the audience tonight, I have three pieces of good news for you. The first piece of good news is you're not alone. This is a very common way to feel. I hear it all the time. So you're not alone. Don't, don't feel like you're lagging behind. We're all kind of in this together and we're all in the same place. The second piece of good news I have is that you've probably actually already started on your net zero carbon journey. You just might have done it for other reasons. So every time you turn the lights off when no one's in the room, every time you don't print something out, every time you put something in the recycling instead of in the bin that goes to landfill, you are doing something to minimise your environmental impact. And often I speak to businesses who say to me, well, we haven't done anything. And then you talk to them about it in a bit more detail and it turns out they have done something. They just haven't done it for an environmental reason. They've done it for a business reason. That's okay. 
that's fine. I can give you an example of that. I spoke to um, a local garage. They, they have cars coming in all the time to be fixed. They have cars coming in all the time with punctures. And what they normally would have done is take the tire off the car and replaced it with a brand new one. That leaves them with a tire that they need to dispose of. It's very expensive to dispose of used car tires. And what they discovered is that there's actually a, a method that they could use to repair punctures in certain instances. And it's perfectly safe to do this. Um, and it's also cheaper to do this. It's cheaper for their customer because they don't have to pay for a brand new tire. They only pay for the repair. And it's cheaper for the business themselves because when they repair the tire, they don't have to dispose of a used tire. So they made the decision to start offering this to their customer for business reasons, because it saved the money, without really thinking that actually that has a big impact or has a big effect on minimizing their impact on the environment by reducing waste. So the thing to keep in mind is you're probably already doing things. You just might have done them for business reasons rather than environmental reasons. That's fine. And one of the things that I always say to businesses that I'm working with is that to be a sustainable business, you have to stay in business. And therefore, I will only recommend things that make good business sense. And there are many of those actions that we can take that do make good business sense. The third piece of good news I have for you is that there is help available. If you want to decarbonize and you're looking for some support to do so, do come and have a chat with me. I have a stand just over there. Um, I'm working on the Eastern New Energy Project. And the whole aim of this project is to help businesses to rapidly decarbonize their operations. So as, I, as I mentioned, we're grant funded. What that means is all of the support that we can provide to businesses is free of charge to the business. There's no cost to you. Um, and this scheme is running until December 2022. So we have just over a year in which we can support businesses who want to look at their operations and try to understand what might be their next steps, and what can they do to decarbonize. We have 20 different partners in the project. They all have a slightly different specialism. So from um, energy auditors to vehicle fleet specialists, to people who can help you if you're looking to develop a new low carbon product or service. I'm going to tell you a bit more about the services in a minute. And so what I wanted to say is if you're in business and you want to decarbonize, let us help you so that you can get on with running your business. It's hard enough running a business um, and you know your business is far better than I could. So you handle running the business. Let Eastern New Energy help you to decarbonize and to manage your carbon emissions. So we're looking to support individual businesses. That's fine. But we're also interested in talking to groups of businesses who are located in the same geographical area. So if you've got lots of businesses on a business park or an industrial estate or in a town center um, who are all located in the same area, there are probably many similarities between you and many ways that you could work together to help the decarbonization process. For example, if we could cover the roofs of an industrial estate with solar PV, um, that would really help to decarbonize uh, energy consumption and we can work with you to look at how do we manage those energy flows is it best to use that generation on site to sell it to your neighbor to store it in a battery or to sell it to a grid and by doing that we can make sure that everybody benefits within that business community so there's lots of reasons to decarbonize um, we've talked a little bit about reducing costs that's probably the the most obvious reason but there are many others as well i've talked to businesses who have found that um, by marketing themselves and their actions to their customers they've attracted new customers or retained old ones they're also finding that um, people want to work for sustainable businesses they want to know that the organizations that they're working for are doing their part and so it's a way of attracting and retaining the best talent for your organization. And finally, we're looking at helping you to build some resilience in your business. There are risks to climate change. We're already seeing them with extreme weather events and flooding that we, we see in the news with heat waves that we've seen over the summer period. And so by looking at your own business and ways that you can decarbonize, you can help to de-risk that for your own business. 
So I said I'd talk about some of the services and how Eastern New Energy can help. As I mentioned, we have lots of delivery partners who have lots of different skills. So I'd say even if there's nothing on this list that particularly jumps out at you, it's worth getting in touch and we can have a quick chat to see if there is anything that we can do for you. Um, if you have a building and you use energy, we can offer you a site energy assessment to help to identify some simple ways that you can uh, reduce your energy consumption. And that might be very simple things like monitoring your consumption and identifying areas where you might be able to switch things off or use uh, more efficient equipment. If you have a vehicle fleet, so cars, vans, trucks, even grey fleet from your, your staff using their own vehicles for business usage, we can offer you a vehicle fleet audit. Uh, don't forget that you won't be able to buy new petrol and diesel vehicles past 2030. So this vehicle fleet audit can assist you to understand how you might be able to make that switch to electric vehicles over the next nine or 10 years. Uh, many businesses ask us for net zero carbon planning, so that's uh, helping you to, to look at well, what are your emissions right now and what might you be able to do in the future to reduce those emissions. Um, and we also have some grants available to help you to do that. So there is a certain amount of grant funding for capital projects uh, that result in lower carbon emissions. So they tend to be things like LED lighting upgrades or solar PV projects. Um, energy efficiency measures, we can fund up to 25% of the cost of your project to a maximum of £30,000. Um, there are some other conditions there that we would go through with you if you were interested in that, that grants programme. And often one of the other options leads to a grant, so we might do a site energy survey first and then advise you on the best route to go down with the grants programme. Um, and then finally, if you are looking at developing a new uh, low carbon uh, product or a new service and you need some assistance to assess the market or access finance or see how you can really uh, build a business plan to bring that product to market. Again, we have experts who are available to help you with that. So if any of that sounds interesting, uh, you can drop us an email directly on this email address, ene at uel.ac.uk. If you're wondering why it's a university address, it's because UEL is the lead partner on this project. Um, or you can contact me directly. My email address is there on the screen. Or you can take a look at our website. The link there is in the slides, which you'll get after this. And do come and have a chat to me afterwards on the stand. Thanks very much, everyone. And I'm going to hand you over to Catherine Jones from the Sunnyside Rural Trust. Thanks. Standard, isn't it? <laughs> uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Catherine. I am Hospital Coordinator at one of our Sunnyside Rural Trust sites. I will whiz through this. I'm aware we are running over a little, so no problem. Uh, so, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what Sunnyside generally does. And actually, a lot of the things we do are very possible for everyone else to do as well. So, uh, it will be a quick, good run through on that. You don't have to do everything that we do, obviously. We have it quite easy because we work outdoors. And you know the nature of our job is to be able to keep everything interesting and and variable for the guys that we look after. Um, so first of all, a bit of a hint: what is a learned disability? Um, you can read all the information if you want. It's essentially an impairment um, of your mind and your learning skills that doesn't just affect a little bit, but you globally it affects your entire life completely to the point that you have a learning disability. So we support adults with mild and moderate learning disabilities. This also comes with things like autism, OCD, ADHD, and things as well like that. So kind of who are we? The name doesn't quite give it away. Um, this We operate as officially a day service for adults with learning disabilities for over 140 service users that come in over the week. We call our service users trainees. And we are a charity and a social enterprise and a trading company all rolled into one. Um, and this is kind of what gives the thing about Sunnyside, which is that we have, you know, people with learning disabilities have the same drive that anyone else does to be busy and have and work to be happy. Uh, people forget this and they're often overlooked. So we occupy that area where trainees 
would essentially work and be happy due to that. And we're very lucky to be able to do that in essentially a therapeutic setting, which is outdoors, which is really great for adults with learning disabilities. So what do we actually do? Um, here's a good list. So all of these things are available to our trainees. Uh, anyone can do anything. It doesn't matter on your abilities. And then on top of that, we also provide social care placements for students in university studying uh, social care. And also we provide a lot of volunteering opportunities to everyone else for a lot of reasons. And some more guys. Where are we? Uh, decorum. <laughs> uh, we have three main base sites, but we've recently acquired a couple of new little sites as well. Um, so Hemel Hempstead is kind of like the flagship one in Apsley. Then we have Berkhamstead. And then North Church, which is where I'm based and we'll be mainly talking about today. And then we have a couple lectures. So we just gained the cafe in um, Hemel Town Centre that was like a community cafe. We've just taken that over. Time flies. I think it's been two months. I'm not really sure. Uh, <laughs> then we also have a, a special project in Bedmond linked to the um, gardener Tom Stewart Smith. So he was a horticultural hero, 2021. Uh, name dropped because we got to go to Hampton Court. <laughs> And then all of our sites also do um, environmentally based stuff and outside contracts. So uh, you've seen us around. We've been around for a while. Uh, we've been around for over 30 years now. Uh, um, this is the Bedman project quickly as well. So we grow all the flowers for the decorum. And then we also grew the perennial, perennial flowers for the garden, which are now the exact ones planted in RHS Wisley. And we got to be on TV. That was very great. Here's the token animal picture. So as you read, a lot of our jobs, we do animal therapy as part of this, and that's actually very integral to our funding that we got as well. But you can uh, see just by looking at them how therapeutic it is to work with them. The guys do all of the work with the animals. Um, you know, they care for them, uh, feed them, uh, change all the waters. They, you know, they do the whole process, and it is real work to them because looking after animals is really hard work. Uh, something that a lot of you guys will be pleased about is our gardening style. I'm sure there's a lot of vegetable growers here. Uh, we don't really use any chemicals whatsoever, and we haven't done for the whole time, which is over 30 years. Uh, we only use physical barriers and things for pests, as you can see on our allotment in Hemel. And we often do things like mixed um, planting teams and companion planting as a result of this. And for the last five years, we've been doing no dig on all of our produce growing space, which Tim will be pleased about, because you essentially don't touch the soil. You just go in the top with the compost so the soil is completely untouched and I was going to mention briefly about carbon sequestering and the benefits but you already know that now and if anyone says that you need fertilizers to grow tomatoes they're wrong and if anyone says you can't grow straight carrots in 100% compost they're also wrong so more of the larger green projects that we do that's worth a quick mention um, that is beneficial to you guys as well is we try and make ethical shopping available for everyone. This includes um, regular household items, mainly like bathroom, kitchen, cleaning products. We have refills. We have like ecological options, sustainable swaps made out of cardboard and paper instead of plastic. Um, we have a lot of uh, fair trade and organic produce in our two shops. Uh, we obviously we grow food as one of our jobs, so we're very invested in uh, our own compost production. We have animals that help and also for food security for our service users, but also we run a veg scheme for uh, the local community. We uh, try really hard to make better energy choices. So this means, uh, quickly I'll mention, um, we, you know, we have a, every time we do a, maybe a grant to get uh, some more equipment, we will actually price it up and cost it for the energy efficient uh, stuff and like make a good point of doing that rather than just going for the cheapest option. Um, and also, which has been poo-pooed a little bit in the last couple of years, we're trying to really focus on being more of a community-based hub where you know everyone can come to us, uh, you know, share the space that we've grown, and uh, you know, share knowledge between different communities that are like-minded. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a bit better on that next year. Um, a quick project that we did for North Church site where I am the last couple of years. Um, we really made sure that when we did the grant to get the new building, we were literally living in sheds until this point. So it's fancy but well deserved. Um, you know, we really made sure that we, when we did all the budgeting and we had cuts like any project does, we made sure that the cuts weren't made to the energy uh, requirements. So we have a huge water tank where we can store water for a whole uh, week worth of irrigation watering just from rainwater in the ground. Uh, you know, we've got solar panels and everything has been done with efficient lighting and things like that. Very fancy. 
one of the things we've been doing for a long time, which is easy for you guys as well, is that we have a lot of electric tools. We've been using them for three or four years, and we use them hard. We're not just delicate because we do a lot of contracts and things. And I can say that they're fine, and they do work. You can't break them. <laughs> they're very hardcore. And as you can see, all of our produce and things, we really reduce the amount of plastic. In fact, no plastic in our produce packaging, and the cafe and farm shops have no single-use plastic that they use in their cafe and their shop itself. Biodiversity, very important to us. We grow food. Is it half of all of the food that requires pollination, including animal feed, that is, is done by honeybees. But that means 50% of the rest of the food requires all the other insects and animals to do the pollination as well. So seeing as our social enterprise and the way we operate relies on that, uh, it's very important to us. And we're lucky that we, you know, we can mix that into our work. A few extra bits uh, we've done before, a quick mentioning on those. Also, we've been really ramping up our wildlife monitoring and survey work. We've always done some, but it's really helpful when you have staff members. We have quite a lot of expertise within our staff now. And over the last three or four years, we've been able to increase a lot of this kind of work that we do within Sunnyside, which the guys benefit from. You know, it's really important with education as well. And I, that's um, one of the main things that we do. We rescue a lot of wood <laughs> as well from various pallets pallets and uh, extra projects. In fact, from our building development, the amount of wood wastage that goes into building development is honestly unbelievable. And two years later, we're still using the excess that we had collected out of the shed that we've stored for all of our projects as well. So our green community wall project, thanks for giving us the money. It was super great. <laughs> uh, so mention the animals briefly, and we get back to that. So essentially, we rescued some livestock. Uh, these sheep are actually non-producing females from the Boxmore Trust. They work as a heritage breeding, so they would have got the chop otherwise. Um, so we have them, and we have a bit of a before and after picture here. Um, so essentially, the green grant money was when we got the animals therapeutically and then realised, you know, we can use them beneficially to look after the land that we have in Orchard. The site is quite large, and only 50% of it is land that we cultivate slash use for human consumption gardens, buildings and stuff like that. And with the team that we have at the moment, we really realise that the land stewardship is just as important. So we're not going to be cultivating all of it. And in fact, uh, these are things that we already have growing in our land uh, that we wish to increase on the biodiversity and also the area in which we can um, look after these kind of species. So the idea of the grant was that the money was essentially used to pay for the fencing to be able to section off our land that had been untouched for 20 to 30 years Definitely previously been touched though, not completely uh, untouched land. There's like walnut trees and things planted there. Um, to basically do a low intensity grazing system across the ground that hasn't been touched for a long time uh, to increase our biodiversity in our meadowland. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had an initial survey done in August 2015 that we've been basing our results off. Uh, this is the very first year, so we hit it pretty hard. Um, here's our goats. Uh, dog for scale before and after uh, and it's completely opened up the rest of our site so our guys can really enjoy the land as well. Uh, fencing is very expensive um, but we had a little bit left over as well so we have built a whole new pond area, wildlife pond specifically. We had a previous small amount of pond land but um, it wasn't really up to scratch so we've redone it and also we bought a moth trap so we can do uh, more survey work with the guys and um, to get them more involved in um, wildlife things like that. So it's been really valuable to us to be able to utilise our land. Thank you very much for listening. Hi again, everyone. Thank you for sending in lots of lovely questions. Let me just get my head around these. Um, <laughs> can the council follow the lead of St Albans and invest in citizen assemblies led by Hearts Middlesex Wildlife Trust? We could achieve a lot if you can facilitate really active creative workshops in the building and local centres, cross fertilisation. Good idea. And yes, absolutely, that's the sort of thing um, over the next few years we would be looking to try and follow the lead of what St Albans have been doing. Um, I know that we've already approached um, uh, the Wildlife Trust to uh, create a biodiversity strategy um, late next year because we're waiting on some biodiversity um, 
uh, reports to come through. Uh, there's um, several in the pipeline at the moment, and they should all be finished by like the end of quarter four next year. So we'll be creating a much bigger biodiversity plan then. Um, there's another one for you. <laughs> Let me just read it. Um, will the Cornborough Council set ambitious, ambitious net zero plans for indirect as well as direct emissions within the borough? If you make the commitment, every person in this room will help you meet it. Um, I can take that one. Uh, so um, we haven't made, sorry, put in, get my head around to indirect emissions. Um, that's already in our strategy. So our three different objectives were direct emissions for our council by 2030. Indirect emissions, which includes our housing stock, is by 2050 at the latest. Um, so we, we have already got that in our strategy. Um, depending on how the question wants it is for the wider borough, we didn't want to set a target on some on the other 99% that's outside of our control. So that's, that's our reason for not setting that target. I hope that answers that question. One for Tim. Uh, for clarification, do Tim's extinction figures mean extinct in Hertfordshire but still exist elsewhere, or have these species become globally extinct? Thank you. Uh, so just for the people at home, um, if they didn't get that on the mic, um, that's um, extinct in Hertfordshire. Uh, so it's locally extinct, but the species, thankfully, are not globally extinct. Another one for either Tim or Sunnyside. Um, which locks up more carbon, a wildflower meadow or newly planted woodland? That's felt like a pub quiz host. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, we are we have run over it a lot, so I'll keep this as the last question. Um, will the Cornborough Council work with the community energy groups 
to finance some of the low carbon infrastructure we need, such as renewable energy and EV charging points. Uh, so the quorum is applying for funding at the moment um, for, uh, to put in more EV charging points. We can only put them in on land that we own. Um, and so we are hoping to have that funding. Um, we wouldn't put it in on la land that isn't ours because um, that would be the, the onus on the landowner, like a supermarket or shopping centre, et cetera. Um, in terms of financing uh, sort of other groups, obviously we have the, the Green Community Grants um, as well, and we will help other um, uh, or help access other funding that is around. Um, so when we do quite frequently get people messaging and ask for, for grant funding, um, I will send the links to any other funding that's around. One of the things from the Decorum Climate Action Network that we will be doing um, is having an ongoing funding spreadsheet on our website, um, and we'll keep that updated um, with every scale of, of funding that there is, and we'll keep sharing the link to that with our monthly newsletters. Um, so hopefully that will help finance things. Um, and just to finalise the question, because um, the much renewable energy, um, we are looking at schemes that so there's there's discussions at the moment that there's no firm decisions but we'll be looking at exploring other ways that we can help make renewable energy such as solar panels more affordable and a widespread thing um so i like i said i will make sure that we go through every question um after the event and um in our wrap-up email i'll make sure that everything's definitely been answered but we will have to bring it to a close um tonight because of being 15 minutes over time <laughs> um so um oh so just to wrap up, um, we have got the, um, the Climate and Ecological Emergency Exhibition in the Marlows, um, so just a reminder to go along to that. Um, a reminder that anyone who hasn't, please uh, join the Decorum Climate Action Network. We really want to um, build this to make it really successful. Uh, the library downstairs does have um, a sustainability stand, which is keeping there throughout November. Uh, so if any of you are library members or would like to become one, because it's more sustainable to borrow books, uh, then feel free to go and explore that. Although they probably won't want people there now, but maybe <laughs> come back again later in the week. Uh, if there is any food and drink left downstairs, um, please help yourselves. We want to make sure there's no food waste after this event. Uh, and uh, we do need to make sure that we um, uh, get out the building fairly soon, otherwise building management will be upset with me. <laughs> um, uh, but um, I, yeah. I don't want to brush people out either, so please do feel free to network as well. Uh, if you did get any lovely photos from this evening, I'd love to see them. Um, so you could either email them to sustainability at decorum.gov.uk uh, or upload them to social media with hashtag decorumcan. Uh, finally, if you could remember to return your name badges so that we can reuse them again at the next event. Uh, and we will send a wrap-up email next week uh, with the um, details and the slides and the questions and everything like that. Uh, so very lastly, just an absolutely massive thank you to everyone that's come here tonight, um, everyone that's been watching it online, thank you very much uh, for tuning in, uh, all of the staff involved behind the scenes, uh, all of the people uh, that have been doing the, the catering and keeping us fed all night um, and the building management for doing an amazing job of getting the room done, there has been a lot that's gone into tonight, um, to all of the wonderful speakers uh, and to all of the storeholders as well. Um, just a huge thank you. Uh, I really hope that this does become a much bigger network. Um, and thank you for attending our first annual event. Thank you.